Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Particle Physics Brick by Brick where we're trying to explain as much about particle physics as we can using Lego. This episode is going to focus on radioactivity in the lead up to us explaining about the weak nuclear force. And we're going to start with a little bit of history. Radioactivity was first discovered in 1896 by Henri Becquerel when he left some uranium salts near some photographic plate and they were exposed. In 1897 the word radioactivity was coined by Marie Curie after she discovered the radioactive elements of radium and polonium with her husband Pierre and it literally means that the atom is actively emitting radiation and in 1899 New Zealander Ernest Rutherford identified that there were not one but two different types of rays that seemed to be coming from these elements and in 1900 a third ray was identified by Paul Villard. Ernest Rutherford named these three rays Alpha, Beta and Gamma. Now the very nature of Alpha, Beta and Gamma were determined by passing the radiations through magnetic fields. If we had a North Pole here and then we put on top of it a south pole such that the magnetic field was pointing out of the screen towards us and then we passed beta rays through it they were discovered to be electrons because they curved within the magnetic field suggesting they had an electric charge and indeed the curvature matched that of the electron that was discovered just a few years earlier and alpha particles were discovered to be helium 2 plus ions or what we would call nowadays a helium nucleus and that was again discovered because it also curved within a magnetic field and the curvature represented a positively charged particle because it curved in the opposite direction to the electron and it also represented a much heavier object because its curvature was less. And in 1914 the gamma rays that Paul Villard discovered were identified as being electromagnetic radiation because they were unaffected by magnetic fields at all. Electromagnetic radiation is just a fancy word for light. So visible light, x-rays and everything else are examples of electromagnetic radiation. Alpha, beta and gamma are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. But you'll notice they weren't named in the order in which their nature was discovered. They were named actually in the order in which they penetrate materials. By penetration we mean how much material this radiation can pass through and still be measured on the other side. So alpha particles are actually stopped by a thin piece of paper. While beta particles and gamma pass through, beta is then stopped by a thin sheet of aluminium foil. Gamma will continue through to be stopped by a few centimetres of lead. And so they're named actually in the order in which they can penetrate materials. Alpha being the least penetrating and gamma the most penetrating. Now let's have a look at these particles. Now the alpha particle has a charge of plus two, beta particles being electron minus one, and being light, the gamma particle has an electric charge of zero. Can you see a correlation? There is a direct correlation between the charge on the particle and its penetration ability. The higher the charge on the particle, the lower its penetration ability. That is because the higher the electric charge on the particle, the more it's going to interact via the electromagnetic force with things in the material that it's passing through. And therefore it's going to lose more energy and it's going to stop quicker. Gamma particles, of course, are the force carriers of the electromagnetic force. So they will eventually lose their energy when they interact with something in the material. Now, before we go any further, that I just want to mention a little bit about nuclear notation. This is a nucleus of an atom. In fact, this is a nucleus of a carbon-14 atom. This isotope of carbon is very special. It's responsible for carbon dating. But if we break it apart into its constituent particles, we see that the carbon-14 is made from six protons and eight neutrons. Now, those of you already familiar with nuclear notation will already know this because the two numbers that are written next to the element symbol of carbon give us a shorthand notation which tells tells us how many protons and neutrons there are. The top number is known as the nucleon number and that tells us the total number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus of that atom. And then the bottom number is the proton number. That tells us how many protons there are in the nucleus of the atom. With the two numbers combined, we can work out the exact number of protons and the exact number of neutrons in the nucleus. Now the energy required to take a nucleus apart like that into its constituent nucleons or neutrons and protons is something that is called the binding energy. So the binding energy per nucleon is different for every single different nucleus, element or isotope. And this is a curve showing the binding energy of the most common isotopes found in nature. You'll notice that they are quite different. And at the very top there is the iron 56 nucleus. Now this isotope of iron is the most stable naturally occurring nucleus. This means it requires the most energy to tear apart the protons and neutrons that make it up. Previously in the electromagnetism video, we've talked about the idea that particles feel a force and they are bound to one another because of a dip in potential energy. And in a very real sense, the binding energy per nucleon 
is the negative of the potential energy that each nucleon experiences being bound to the nucleus. So we can actually turn this chart on its head and instead of getting the binding energy, we actually get the negative potential energy. Each proton and neutron has a negative potential energy. That means it's stuck in a potential energy well. And to become free, it would have to have a potential energy of zero because something with a potential energy of zero is totally free from any type of binding force because it has escaped the force field from which it's in. And of course, when we're talking about potential energy, the lower the potential energy, the more stable the nucleus will be because the more stuck the protons and neutrons are. That means that right at the bottom there again is that iron 56 nucleus. It is the most stable naturally occurring nucleus. And really everything wants to become as low in energy as possible. That was the reason behind positive and negative electric charges attracting one another. The whole universe wants to be in the lowest energy state it can be. That means that any nucleus will, if it can, take any possible route to become more stable, to become more like iron 56. If we have a large nucleus, say uranium 238 right up the end here, that uranium 238 nucleus will use any and all methods it can to become more like iron 56 which would obviously involve it losing some of that mass, losing protons and neutrons along the way to become closer and closer to a more stable nucleus. And this is why radioactivity occurs. Radioactivity allows these heavy nuclei to lose some protons and neutrons and transform into other elements. Each nucleus can lose energy in a number of different ways. And those are the three different radioactivities of alpha, beta, and gamma. What is the nuclear notation for each of the alpha, beta, and gamma? Well, the alpha is made from a helium nucleus, and a helium nucleus is comprised of two protons and two neutrons. And so therefore, that would give it a nuclear notation of four and two. The electron is not really made of anything else. It's not made of protons and neutrons. So we would imagine that the beta would have a zero and a zero. And then the photon, again, not really made of anything, it's the force carrier of electromagnetism. Therefore, we would expect that that would also have a zero and a zero for nucleon number and proton number. So with these nuclear notations, we can then form nuclear equations for the radioactive decay via alpha, beta, and gamma. So the alpha is nice and simple. The decay of uranium-238 here into thorium-234 is shown because of the emission of an alpha particle. The difference in the nucleon number between the uranium and the thorium is a difference of four because that is the nucleon number of the alpha particle, while the difference in the proton number is two because that's the proton number of the alpha. And so it's quite simple to see how an alpha decay changes one element into another. The gamma particle with zero and zero makes no change in element at all. This is an example where an excited nucleus of barium called 137M, the M, stands for metastable. It means that the nucleus is in a slightly higher energy level which fairly readily decays. And so this excited state of the barium nucleus decays to the normal barium nucleus 137. And while it does that, it emits one of these gamma particles or a photon. But the problem is our initial thoughts of beta is incorrect. Beta does not have zero for nuclear number and proton number. Let's then go back to our carbon 14. Here we have our eight neutrons and six protons laid out nicely. We can use those to build a carbon 14 atom. But what if we had a change? What if we changed one of those neutrons into a proton? Then that would give us a building set of seven neutrons and seven protons. Now, if we pieced all of those together to form a nucleus, that would form a nucleus of nitrogen 14. And this is the exact transformation that occurs when carbon beta decays to form nitrogen 14. And it is this carbon 14 beta decay that is actually behind carbon dating of organic materials. So it tells us basically how old things are. And so all we did was we changed a neutron into a proton. Now this isn't something that's possible. The problem with this is there is an imbalance between the before and after scenarios. You'll see that there's an imbalance in the proton number. That points towards a more deeper fundamental imbalance and that more fundamental imbalance is to do with electric charge. We start with zero electric charge beforehand on the neutron and then end up with a positive charge on the proton afterwards. Now, electric charge 
is an example of a certain property of particle which must be conserved. These, along with the other charges for the other forces of nature, cannot change before and after an interaction. This means that if we start with zero electric charge, we must end with zero electric charge as well. The only way for this to be possible is if we also emit a negatively electrically charged electron alongside the proton so that the sum in the charge after this transformation is also zero. This is the reason behind a beta particle being a fast moving electron. The electron has to be emitted if we are to balance the electric charge. So the change that occurred in the nucleus was that a neutron was turned into a proton and in the process an electron was emitted. But hang on, wait, was there another particle there? Hmm. There must be something else going on. To find out what that mystery particle was and how it led to the discovery of the weak force, check out the video on beta decay. Thanks for listening. If you would like to know more, subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on social media for more information. You could also buy the book. Particle Physics Brick by Brick is available through online retailers and many local bookstores. Other languages are also available. If you follow this bit.ly link, you can also get access to lots of educational resources and information on where you can get your hands on LEGO to play along. LEGO is a registered trademark of the LEGO Group, which does not sponsor, authorise or endorse these videos in any way.